Nefertari, or Nef, as her friends call her, was getting worried. Her rich friend Anna Delvey had her credit card rejected for, embarrassingly, the twelfth time. They had just spent almost $300 for dinner at the fancy Italian restaurant, Sant Ambroia's. Neff works at the concierge at New York City's 11 Howard Hotel, so she wasn't exactly rich. Her friend was known to throw $100 bills around like it was nothing, but all of a sudden, she had no cash, and her cards were all getting declined. Neff knew deep down that she probably has to cover the bill this time. As she sweated, she quietly transferred money from her savings to cover the bill, and that's when Anna asked if she can cover for them and that she'd pay her back ASAP. The concrete jungle of New York City is where dreams are made and lost. Obviously, making lots of money is usually the ultimate goal for people that move to the city, but that's not how things things win for Anna Delvey. She got people to believe that she was a wealthy trust fund baby. She tricked banks and people in high society out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. But just how did she do it? Before moving to New York to run one of the wildest scams imaginable, Delvey had been an intern in the fashion department of a public relations firm in Berlin. This was most likely where all of her knowledge and idea of living the high life came from. After that internship, Anna went to Paris and landed a coveted position at the French culture and fashion magazine, Purple. In Paris, she became close with the magazine's editor-in-chief, Oliver Zam, and André Sareva, one of the owners of Le Baron, a famous nightclub in Paris. According to reports, this is the same time she started to figure out how to tell her lies. When Delvey moved to New York at first, she spent time at 11 Howard in Soho for a while. That's when she first slipped a $100 bill to Neff, and that's when their friendship first First began. Delvey booked into a Howard Deluxe room back in February 2017 at a cost of around $400 a night. When Delvey would slip by Neff's table, she would almost always give her a $100 tip. According to Neff, Delvey gave $100 to almost everyone, even her Uber drivers. She also wouldn't allow Neff to reach for her credit card, because on Neff's description of Delvey, she was strangely mannered for the typical rich person she encountered. Apparently, Delvin wasn't exactly nice, but she also wasn't mean, and she knew exactly the right people to know. She also knew all the cool places to go in the city. Neff figured out that she didn't need her concierge experience. She needed a friend. Delvey came across as a secret princess, except her fairy tale was set in modern-day New York City. While Delvey was in New York, she wasn't just not working. Well, she had to look like she had something going on. She would tell people she was working towards her idea of launching a private club that was geared towards art. It was supposed to be along the lines of Soho House, the type of club that caters towards hand-picked exclusivity instead of just using money money as a differentiator. Neff became Delvey's almost de facto secretary. She'd help her organize her business launches and dinners at restaurants throughout the city. Delvey slowly drew Neff into her life. She would often invite her to different spa treatments, such as massages, cryotherapy, or manicures, all on Delvey's dime, of course. Delvey pretty much lived like a celebrity with no limits on her spending. For example, she paid $4,500 for a package of personal sessions with a personal trainer. That's just one example. Delvey was always at the pinnacle of New York nightlife. She would be at parties dressed to the nines with dresses made by brands such as Balenciaga and Versace. She was constantly meeting rich and important people and making new connections. To anyone that would listen, she would tell them she has 60 million euros tucked away in her trust fund overseas, and everyone believed her. Because why not? It's New York City. It's a place where there are plenty of rich kids running around with trust funds. In the world Delvey threw herself in, everyone in that circle were all friends on the superficial level only. Everything was taken at face value. But it's rare for people to really know the whole truth about anyone else. And this was the environment that worked perfectly for Anna. For example, Delvey one time convinced Michael Zufu Huang, the founder of Beijing's M. Woods Museum, to go on a trip together to Venice. She convinced him to go to the Venice Biennale, a large international art exhibition held every two years. She charmed Huang enough for him to book the plane tickets first. <laughs> And oh yeah, of course she asked him to get the hotel in Venice as well on his credit card. Of course she'd pay him back ASAP, because she had trouble that day getting money out of her big trust fund overseas. Huang did notice one funny thing though. Delvey only ever paid with cash it seems. When they got back from the trip, he asked her to pay him back. and. 
just like everyone else, she promised to pay him later. All the way until he just forgot about it. This method worked for a lot of her rich friends. They tend to forget about the money Delvey owed them. Rachel Williams was another one of Anna's friends who was scammed by Anna, and Rachel was nowhere rich. She was supposedly Anna's best friend. In an interview with Harper's Bazaar, she said that she never saw signs from Anna to think that she was someone living a lie. She claimed that Anna was just weirdly socially inept, but also very charismatic. They both had taken a trip to a luxury resort in Marrakech, Morocco, and Rachel ended up paying a whopping $62,000 on her credit card. It wasn't exactly a one-time fee. It was just one thing after another. First it was the villa, then it was the flight. Williams had to pay around $4,000 for both their flights. She didn't want to say no because she wanted to go on the trip too. She never felt that she wasn't going to get paid back by Anna, but it only got worse when they got to Marrakech. Anna picked out $1,300 worth of dresses. As for their hotel bill, it cost a whopping $52,000. According to Rachel, Anna hired a private butler tour guides, cars, and tennis lessons every morning. Anna assured her, however, that she would wire her over $70,000 to make sure all the expenses were covered. Of course, Anna didn't pay her back. Delphi made up stories of how her family built their fortune. She told some people that her father was a diplomat for Russia. To a lot of people, that just meant money from corruption. To some people, she'd tell that she was a titan in the oil industry. There was also the story that her family was big in antiques in Germany. Another one was that they had a successful solar panel business. But the simple truth was none of this was true. Her father was a truck driver who later worked as an executive at a transport company. When the company became insolvent in 2013, he opened a heating and cooling business that specialized in energy efficient devices. And her last name wasn't even Delvey at all. Her real last name is Sorkin. Delvey was her mom's maiden name. She wasn't from Germany. She was born in 1991 in Doma Dodovo, a working class satellite town southeast of Moscow in Russia. Her mom owned a small convenience store before becoming a full-time housewife. Her German story came about because her family moved to Germany in 2007 when Anna was 16. Anna was described by her German classmates as a quiet girl who had a difficult time speaking the language. When Anna graduated from high school in 2011, she moved to London to attend school. Her parents, who trusted her and had high expectations for her, paid for her to go to school. But instead, Anna dropped out and returned to Berlin where she started her new life as Anna Delvey. How did Anna completely fool New York's high society? And why did she do it? Anna admitted it was simply so easy to fool everyone into believing that she was incredibly wealthy. Anna pretty much figured out that people are easily gullible when you look and spin like a millionaire. She basically distracted people with shiny objects to distract them from the truth. Her tool was with large wads of cash that made her look like she had a lot of money. Even though she'd throw around hundreds when people were watching, Anna would always trick her rich friends into paying the big bills, such as hotels and expensive dinners. She would come up with a ton of different excuses. A lot of times, she would claim that she lost her wallet or that she accidentally checked her wallet in with her luggage, and her friends would have no other choice but to cover the bill when she asked, because of course, they're rich too. They can't look poor and stingy, and plenty of people in high society failed to see the red flags. Sorokin would routinely claim that there was difficulty moving her assets from overseas. Every day, it'd be a new story. She would laugh it off as forgetfulness when her friends pressed her to pay them back, and they'd give her more time because Anna always promised to pay them back twice as much. Based on her interviews, Anna made it seem like she was just faking it until she made it. And according to her, she believed that success would have really come to her one day. She did set up a lot of meetings because she really believed success was going to happen for her. She just needed time and money. Anna claimed that she was completely misrepresented in court by the prosecution. According to her, the motive wasn't for stealing money, nor was it just to be a wannabe socialite. She explained that her motive was never just about the money. What she wanted was the power. Anna's hotel bill were the first loose threads of her fraudulent schemes that unraveled in November of 2016. What finally got her was applications for big loans. Anna submitted documents claiming a net worth of 60 million euros in Swiss accounts to City National Bank. That was her attempt in getting a $22 million loan. She claimed that she wanted the loan in order to finance the space for her private club idea. And in the next month, she submitted the same documents to Fortress Investment Group in the same attempt to get a $25 million to $35 million loan. When Fortress asked her for $100,000, Anna convinced City National to extend her $100,000 line of credit. Apparently, 
She was afraid of Fortress's decision to send representatives to Switzerland to check her story, where she had no assets whatsoever. So Anna stopped the entire process. Fortress had kept 45 grand for their expenses and they returned $55,000. She wired that to a Citibank account that she used for her own personal expenses. She then deposited $160,000 worth of bad checks into the same Citibank account and managed to withdraw $70,000 in cash. And this was how she managed to pay off her stay at 11 Howard. And this explains why she only used cash. Anna checked into several other hotels in New York. However, the managers began to get suspicious of her as she wouldn't be able to give them a proper working credit card for any incidental charges. Anna would tell the managers that she would wire money, but when the money transfers she promised didn't arrive, the hotels would kick her out and keep her belongings. When the police tracked her down in 2017, Anna was arrested on six charges of grand larceny for scamming wealthy New York City individuals and several hotels. It was true that she had falsified some bank records, but she and her lawyers claimed that it was only because she had a big dream. According to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, her scams totaled to roughly $275,000. In April of 2019, Anna was found guilty on four counts of theft of services, three counts of grand larceny, and one count of first-degree attempted grand larceny. She was acquitted of two other charges. She was not found guilty on another charge of attempted grand larceny in the first degree for the attempted $22 million loan she tried to get. And she was found not guilty for scamming her friend Rachel out of $60,000 for their Morocco trip. On May 9th, 2019, Anna was given a sentence of 4 to 12 years in state prison, fined $24,000, and ordered to pay restitution of $199,000. Anna spent 19 months in jail at Rikers Island and 21 months in prison at Albion Correctional Facility. At the end of February 2021, she was released from prison. In a New York Times article, Anna simply said that she wasn't sorry. She said, quote, I'm not sorry. I'd be lying to you and to everyone else and to myself if I said I was sorry for anything. I regret the way I went about certain things. She simply claimed that she was going to pay everyone back, eventually. All it was going to take was a bit of time. Danielle Miller is an Instagram influencer with a large following. She's known for her glamorous, jet-setting lifestyle, she posted photos at luxury California hotels and on first-class international flights. But Miller's utopia came to a screeching halt when she was arrested on charges of wire fraud. She was accused of stealing the identity of a Massachusetts resident to open a bank account and apply for a COVID-19 small business relief loan worth more than $100,000. She used this money which was intended for struggling businesses during the pandemic to fund her expensive habits. Court documents showed that she charged her $5,000 luxury hotel bill from the Petit Armitage to the fraudulent bank account and then posted a photo with a geotag for the location. Prosecutors took Miller's Instagram photos, which she once used for likes and attention, and used them against her proving how she used the money for the wrong reasons. If convicted, Miller faces a $250,000 fine and up to 20 years in prison. But this isn't the first time she's gotten into trouble for scamming, and it certainly won't be the last. Miller comes from wealthy Manhattan parents and grew up in an apartment next to the Ritz-Carlton overlooking Central Park. Her father, Michael Miller, was a real estate attorney and former president of the New York State Bar Association. Her mother was a Rockette for 20 years before she became a full-time stay-at-home mom. Miller first realized her love for attention at the prestigious Horace Mann School. It was 2004, Miller was in eighth grade, when her crush dared her via AOL Instant Messenger to prove she wasn't crude. She grabbed her Swiffer mop and pressed record. She sent three videos to the boy who sent them to his best friend. Soon enough, the entire school had seen the videos and Miller had a new nickname, Swiffer Girl. She had attended Horace Mann since she was two years old, but it took only a few seconds of video footage to completely change her reputation. People whispered about her. Parents told their children not to invite her over. 
Miller was so embarrassed that she stayed home for a week and debated switching schools. But she didn't. By ninth grade, Miller decided to ditch her nice, quiet girl identity and embrace her new reputation. She got a fake ID and started drinking and partying. Miller remembers herself as Horace Mann's It Girl. For her sweet 16, her parents threw her a huge party and hired a Rod Stewart impersonator to sing Hot Legs. Miller's friends said she tried to pass him off as the real Rod Stewart, which she denies. Another friend claimed Miller lied about her father owning their apartment building. Her friends quickly caught on to her constant lies. Miller even admitted it. And this is just the beginning. Desperate to escape the reputation that followed her through high school, she moved across the country for college, enrolling at Arizona State University. When she told people she went to Horace Mann, they asked if she knew Swiffer Girl. A fraternity brother told the entire school about her in a university-wide email. Someone shoved a letter under her dorm room door saying that they knew about her past. She graduated from ASU in 2012 and moved to Los Angeles, living at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel in a pool cabana suite and working various PR jobs. She started dating a rich DJ and main mingling with celebrities like Paris Hilton, David Arquette, Farrell, and Skrillex. By 2013, Miller found herself with a new group of friends, including socialite Quentin Esme Brown. Brown climbed up the fame ladder herself, marrying reality TV star P.C. Peterson, the grandson of the founder of the private equity firm Blackstone. At their Las Vegas wedding, Tiffany Trump was their flower girl. One day, Brown got an angry phone call from her mother about a $20,000 credit card bill. Brown went to the bank and asked them to print out all of the checks written from her account in the past month. Five of the checks were made out to Danielle Miller. Brown's mother called Miller's father, who cut her off from any further financial support and returned her leased Mercedes to the dealership. Still, she continued spending wildly on designer bags and expensive dinners. Hoping to get her life back on track, Miller applied and was accepted to Pepperdine University Law School in 2016. The summer after her first year, she moved to New York City, where she secured an internship with a family friend and New York Justice. She was good at the job, but continued her spending habits. She used her stolen credit card information to go to the body factory salon on the Upper West Side. When the credit card was reported twice for fraud, the spa noticed. When she went back to New York for Thanksgiving and booked an appointment at the spa, she was met by the police. She was charged with identity theft and grand larceny. Miller tried to sweet talk the arresting officer, saying that her father is the head of the bar association. She was interning for a judge, and she hadn't even made the appointments herself. Her assistant did. It didn't work. Her connections did help at court, but her law career was put on hold. At this point, her father said that he didn't want any contact with his daughter anymore. Her mother said she still wanted a relationship, but cut her off soon after. In California, Miller met Mackenzie Day, a model with Marine veteran working in marketing. He saw Miller's potential as a clever marketer and decided to launch a PR firm together. Day thought Miller's father was financially supporting her the whole time. When Day wanted to end the relationship, Miller tried to stop him by saying she was suicidal. Day called the police, who brought her to the hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. Evaluation. He was able to get into her email account and discovered that she opened several credit cards and took out business loans in his name. Miller denied the loans and insisted that she and Day took out the credit cards together. She stole nearly $200,000 from him and their friend. To this day, Miller continues to deny it. After serving as a Marine in two wars, Day still calls his experience with Miller one of the most insane he's ever had. A few months later, she was arrested at the San Diego-Mexico border after a birthday trip with friends. She missed a court appearance in New York with a fraudulent spot charges and was picked up on a warrant. She pleaded guilty and was sentenced to a year at Rikers Island. At Rikers, she met Sierra Blass, another scammer who was in jail for violating parole after being convicted of identity theft. Blass was first arrested at Bergdorf Goodman in 2015 for stealing people's credit card information to go on a $20,000 shopping spree. Miller and Blass became fast friends in jail. In 2020, when Miller ran into Blass at a restaurant in Manhattan's Upper East Side, they devised a plan. Miller would be the trapper and take on the persona of a stolen identity while Blast did more of the behind-the-scenes work. During COVID, they flew to Miami and rented a two-bedroom apartment. They went on joy rides and Rolls Royces and shopping sprees at Balmain and Gucci. That spring, when stores started opening again, Miller tried to withdraw $8,000 from a woman's bank account, which triggered Chase Bank call 911. Miller and Blast were arrested in possession with three fake driver's license and credit cards, six cell phones, and $25,000 cash. They pleaded not guilty. Miller went back to prison for the second time that year. Blast bailed Miller out of 
jail, and she quickly got to work on a new scam. This time, she targeted the federal government. She hacked into the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles to steal 27 identities. Then she used people's information to apply for 10 loans from the Small Business Association, including the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Several applications were denied, but one of them was successful. The federal government deposited $125,000 into a bank account Miller opened in another person's name. Over the next eight months, Miller received four more loans worth nearly $1 million. She used another stolen identity to defraud Arizona out of more than $6,000 in unemployment benefits. Miller saw the COVID pandemic as an opportunity to kick her scamming expertise into motion. She denies learning any of her skills at Riker. Instead, she did some internet searching and downloaded Telegram to join group chats that discussed where to find people's personal information. One time, she challenged herself to find Warren Buffett's social security number. She found it quickly. Using the money she secured through SBA loans, Miller led the extravagant lifestyle she craved. She bragged about her Chanel, Gucci, and Prada outfits on Instagram. She booked private jets from Miami to LA and where she spent nearly $6,000 at the Petit Armitage, ate expensive dinners at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and drove a Rolls Royce down the streets. In Miami, she rented a swank white marble clad apartment under one of her victims' names. According to Miller, she paid for everything with her own money and received DMs from scammers around the world begging to work with her. In May 2021, Miller got a Brazilian butt lift surgery and was recovering in the comfort of her Miami apartment with two private nurses and an Oxycontin prescription. One day, she received a phone call from the front desk asking her to report to the front lobby. She opened her front door and federal agents busted inside. In Miller's apartment, agents discovered a Rolex, Dior blouse and shoes, Louis Vuitton bag, and Remoa luggage, believed to be purchased with the SBA loan money. They seized $4,000 cash, $28,000 worth of money orders, several fake IDs and bank cards. On one of her iPhones, feds found emails between Miller, posing as someone else, and Chime Financial saying that she was in tears over her money being held hostage by the bank. She tried to book a private flight under someone else's name, but the company sent federal agents a photo of the license Miller used to book the reservation. The ID was a Massachusetts driver's license with Miller's picture someone else's name. More incriminating evidence came from ATM security footage that showed a mask covering much of her face, but the signature wishbone necklace gave her away. Authorities also connected her to a zip card that Miller rented with yet another fake ID. In the car, agents found a government document with the name Danielle Miller on. So far, feds have seized more than $600,000 from Miller. While on house arrest awaiting trial, Miller decided to occupy her time with social media's newest trend, TikTok. She uses TikTok to show off her life against the advice of her probation officer. Despite being locked inside, Miller found new ways to draw attention to herself. One article from Model on a Mission magazine calls Miller an entrepreneur and philanthropist who started an organization to raise money for orphan children in Botswana and supports Miley Cyrus's Happy Hippie Foundation and Pepperdine's Micro Enterprise Program. But this article, which is full of praise, is likely a paid post written by Miller herself. Unknown to many of her TikTok subscribers and magazine readers, Miller is actually sitting at home all day with a bulky black tracking monitor on her ankle. In May 2021, Danielle was arrested and indicted on three counts of wire fraud and two counts of aggravated identity theft. Each charge of wire fraud carries a possible 20-year prison sentence, three years of supervised release, and a $250,000 fine. The aggravated identity theft charges each carry a mandatory two-year prison sentence, one year of supervised release, and a $250,000 fine. She pleaded not guilty to all charges. Despite all of her scamming, Miller seems to be in dire need of cash. She posted on Facebook about an open room in her Greenwich Village three-bedroom apartment for $1,200 per month. She offered to lease the place on a month-to-month -month basis with no credit or background check required. But instead of being intrigued by the beautiful apartment, commenters seem to be more interested in the opportunity to live with scammer extraordinaire and Swiffer girl, the Danielle Miller. In late October of 2022, Danielle was sentenced to five years in prison for a separate charge of bank fraud in Florida. Her case was heard in the 12th Judicial Circuit Court in Sarasota, where Judge Thomas Krug gave her the max sentence. She still faces trial in late November of 2022 for her pandemic loan-related charges. Yasmin Gundaugen's story and the answers to all those questions begin with a Facebook post from 2015. In the post, Gundogan is pictured with her family. Under the photo is a comment written by her mother, Michaela Gundogan, that, when translated from German to English, says, My sweets, followed by two red heart emojis. Facebook profiles are typically mere highlights of someone's life, a literal snapshot into who they are and what they do. 
In Gundogan's case, her snapshot tells a far more complicated story. Many of Gundogan's photos feature her spending time with her family and friends, which Gundogan seems to have in bulk. In almost all the images Gundogan posted in 2015, she had a warm, gregarious smile along with several pics with puckered lips, and she almost always wears a party dress. The photos are fuzzy, but show Gundogan dressed up, standing, or sitting next to her family and friends. In the photos, Gundogan was usually eating a dinner at a restaurant, sometimes for a family gathering, or partying at a bar with friends, where other people dance in the background with colorful drinks in hand. The color composition was often altered by Instagram photo filters of Gundogan's choice. In the foreground, Gundogan beams like any other extroverted 20-something-year-old having fun on a night out in the mid-2010s. Her smile and kissy face is not showing a hint of criminal in their vivacious charm. However, there was another side to Gundogan besides the Facebook version she perpetuated. A side that makes the crimes committed seem even stranger than before. Occasionally sprinkled in amongst Gundogan's selfies and candid shots are images depicting religious objects like the Quran, overlaid with quotes discussing issues dealing with Islam. Gundogan, who is part Turkish, appears to be a passionate Muslim. Her profile's cover photo features the torso of a woman wearing a sparkling lace dress holding the Quran, golden inlays weaved along its spine. The cover photo is from 2015, meaning Gundogan hasn't posted or altered her page in six years. She posted no photos, no comments, no links, no nothing. The years between 2015 and 2021 are a mystery. What changed in those years? How did a fun-loving, family-oriented, religiously inclined girl in her late 20s turn into an Ocean's Eleven level heist thief? Fast forward to 2021, and Gundogan is working at Loomis as a currency packing assistant. Specifically, Gundogan packages banknotes into cash cassettes. They're locked containers used to secure cash inside ATMs so they can be transported via armored truck to various bank branches and installed into their cash machines. Only a select few had the kind of access Gundogan did. Thus, only a few had the same opportunity to swindle millions. While her crime may seem sensational, it's not the first time someone on the inside has concocted a plan to rob Loomis. Loomis has been transporting valuables since 1897. Lee Loomis took advantage of the Alaskan gold rush in the late 19th century by transporting supplies and miners to golden rivers of Alaska on guarded dog sleds. Riding on his success in Alaska, Loomis continued to grow his company, eventually branching out to money transportation. He applied the same amount of care he gave to the gold miners, and the rest is history. But despite their reliable reputation, Loomis has been robbed three times from the inside, including Gundogan's heist. The first two heists occurred in 1997, when combined, the thieves would have stolen $36 million from Loomis if they had planned a little more thoroughly. The first attempt involved a regional vault supervisor loading an armored Loomis car up with $17 million and transferring said money to vehicles owned by the perpetrators. On paper, the heist seemed like a clever idea straight out of the Italian job. However, the vault supervisor and his associates were later caught by authorities. The second heist of 1997 was conducted by an American armored car driver who handcuffed two of his co-workers, left them at two different locations, and made off with $18 million in cash packed inside his Loomis car. After getting away, the driver stopped by a storage shed and hid the money before fleeing to Mexico. When he returned to the States a year later, authorities welcomed him home with handcuffs and criminal charges. Both heists ultimately failed. They were complex and creative, but could not be pulled off in the end. It's unlikely Gundogan found any Ocean's Eleven-style fountains to stand in front of while driving away from her former job, $10 million in tow. What's important, though, is that unlike her male predecessors, Gundogan got away, at least for the time being. Her heist began on a Friday. Gundogan showed up for work like usual, going to the same area as always, the room containing the cash cassettes. This time, Gundogan shook things up a bit. Instead of placing the banknotes into the cassettes, Gundogan packed $10 million into money-carrying bags and threw them into a rolling trash can. Her co-workers were walking around the facility, so Gundogan covered the bags with trash and rolled them outside, appearing to be just another employee taking out a full can of garbage. Nothing suspicious, except for the getaway van she rented to transport the money. Similar to the trash can, the Mercedes Vito didn't look suspicious at first glance unless you happen to know the license plate belonged to a stolen car. Nevertheless, 
No one batted an eye as Gundogan loaded up the security bags, stuffed with bills, and hightailed it out of Loomis in her rented veto, vanishing like a Las Vegas magician. Four days later, Loomis employees took the cash cassettes, injected them into the money machines, and after testing the machine, realized the cassette was empty. Ta-da! Loomis notified German law enforcement, and a search ensued. Several weeks passed, and authorities found no trace of Gundogan, forcing them to launch a public search. As of now, Germans all across the nation were alerted to be on the lookout for a woman in her late 20s, early 30s, brown eyes, straight brown hair, and possibly carrying around $10 million. Authorities started sifting through potential accomplices. Past heists usually took multiple people to pull off. In 97, the first heist required several people, while the second heist was a solo mission. So investigators were left with a toss-up until they found a suspect who was quickly proven to be an accomplice to Gundogan. Very little information about this accomplice has been released to the public. Investigators are currently withholding information on any suspects involved with Gundogan's heist. But naturally, there are plenty of rumors surrounding the identity of other accomplices, including Gundogan's father. So far, the only public information on Mr. Gundogan are some comments he made to the media in response to his daughter's heist. He expressed how he could not take the pain anymore. Gundogan's entire family was devastated by the news. The girl they grew up with had disappeared with $10 million, and they'll probably never see her again. Mr. Gundogan is probably feeling the most pain of all since he was the one who helped Yeisman get the job at Loomis, where he works as an armored car driver. Though he may seem like a potential accomplice, Mr. Gundogan has come out clean after being investigated by German authorities. Investigators have instead altered course towards another potential source of information. So far, they're only rumor. Gundogan's friends and co-workers have been talking, and the rumors may have some merit based on these conversations. They potentially explain the mysterious girl we saw earlier on Facebook and how she pulled the heist off with help from someone on the outside. Gundogan's friends seriously doubt she planned the heist herself. The reason they give is quite blunt. According to investigative interviews, Gundogan's friends claim she was not smart enough to orchestrate the heist. While the plan may seem easy on the surface, you walk in, take the money, shove it in the bag, camouflage it under trash, roll it out, and take the cash home, Loomis employees insist the plan was not that simple. They allege the process of moving the $10 million was the part that required the most brain power. Power, Gundogan's friend says, she lacks. Everyone that knows her insists Gundogan was not smart enough to pull the heist off successfully. One former friend says with 100% certainty, someone else masterminded the plan and Gundogan was just following instructions. Without the $10 million moving through several so-called locks to migrate into Gundogan's cash cassette, those instructions would not have been possible. Put another way, whoever planned the heist had to understand the complexities involved in moving money around Loomis's security system and understanding Gundogan's friends and co-workers say she doesn't possess. If this claim is valid, then who's the mastermind? The answer may lie in Gundogan's past. Years before she worked for Loomis, she could be found running a bar in a shady part of town known as the Train Station District. In what locals call Shiva Bars, Gundogan intertwined herself with individuals known for being affiliated with organized crime. It's possible Gundogan befriended members of a crime organization and was later recruited to perform a heist for said organization. An employee who worked with Gundogan at the bar confirmed these allegations, sending the case down a rabbit hole filled with guns, people who don't talk to police, and a possible Bonnie and Clyde type love story. It sounds a bit crazy, but a source close to Gundogan said the former bartender might have developed a relationship with a German mobster and pulled the heist out of love. This rumor would explain how Gundogan changed from 2015 to 2021 the mystery years where she disappeared from Facebook. The rumors might also explain why leads have been so scarce since the summer of 2021. Criminal organizations are not easy to investigate. If Gundogan worked for one such establishment, she might never be found, leaving her case unsolved. Only time will tell. As authorities continue to investigate potential accomplices, we as observers can only wonder where she disappeared and ask the question, will she ever be found? Or will Yasmin Gundogan drive off into the sunset in her rented Mercedes Vito? Belle Gibson was born on October 8th, 1991. She lived in ordinary Australian life. However, something flipped, like a switch in her mind, that drove her to become one of the biggest liars and scammers in recent
recent memory. She told the world she had cancer and profited from a wellness app she claimed kept her alive. But when the charade came crashing down, Gibson finally had to face the consequences for her web of deceit and the Apple Watch may be culpable in the whole thing. Gibson left her family home at 12 to live with a classmate and eventually moved in with a family friend. She attended Wynnum State High School in Queensland until she dropped out in the 10th grade. She would later claim that she was homeschooled. At 18, Gibson had a son and with no real information as to who the father is, we imagine the thought of being a single mother drove her to pursue financial gains by any means necessary. According to the Daily Mail, a man named Clive Rothwell has been acting as the child's stepfather since he was born. Bell, however, claims to know very little about him, even though he's been funding her lifestyle for the past few years. After dropping out of school, Gibson worked for a catering company, perhaps an honest living, to care for her child. Her co-workers described Gibson as a lost soul, saying that she appeared disturbed and always told some really vivid stories. Her colleagues there remember her as not having any family or friends to hang out with, and they also recall her talking about cancer way before she officially announced she had it. Turning 18 was a bittersweet moment for Gibson, but that's if everything we know so far is genuine. The same year her son was born, in 2009, Gibson was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. The whole cancer story had different versions, and any keen person would have noticed some discrepancies as soon as it came out. Hiding behind her pretty face, fashionably tattooed body, and dazzling smile, the dots didn't add up every time Gibson narrated her tragic journey. After going public, Gibson became a media star. In interviews, she claimed to have suffered from malignant brain, blood, spleen, uterine, liver, and kidney cancers. With a few years left to live, Gibson felt scared for herself and her newborn son. She went on the offensive, claiming that a cervical cancer vaccine called Gardasil gave her cancer. Fast forward to November 2014, when her inspirational book, The Whole Pantry, told yet another version of her diagnosis. In the preface of the cookbook, Gibson claimed that her cancer had gone into remission and that no new cells had grown. It was all thanks to the dietary plans laid out in the pages to come. However, months before the book came out, Gibson posted that her cancer had spread, reaching her kidneys and liver on her social media page. Then, in a horrible twist of fate, her cancer moved to her brain, blood, spleen, and uterus. While her cancer, if real, could have spread that rapidly, it didn't line up with the timeline and facts laid out in her book. With star status as a relentless cancer fighter, it was now time for Gibson to start making the most out of her situation. The Whole Pantry app officially launched and it launched with a bang. The health, wellness, and lifestyle app received a glorious reception, recording some 300,000 downloads. Each downloading cost $3.79. The app was so successful that Apple, yes, the one and only Steve Jobs founded Apple, flew her to California to launch the Apple Watch. Apple was so infatuated with Gibson's story that the Whole Pantry app became pre-installed on Apple Watches. The Whole Pantry book was published by Penguin Books and would later be sold in Ireland, Britain, and the US. The launch of the app and the book left Gibson feeling like a star. She amassed over 200,000 followers on Instagram and treated them to endless inspirational quotes such as stop waiting for Friday, for summer, for someone to fall in love with you for life. Her unsuspecting fans and the online community fell for her empty quotes. The whole pantry app was voted the best food and drink app in 2013. By early 2015, Gibson had raked in over $1 million between app and book sale. Through her platforms, Gibson introduced and preached alternatives to curing cancer. She advocated for exercise, healthy eating, and a positive mindset, which to her credit are all things we should strive to do with our lives. However, to say that they'll cure cancer is a gross oversight. On her now deleted Instagram account with hundreds of thousands of followers, Gibson consistently promoted more controversial or potentially dangerous alternative medical practices, including Gerson therapy, which is basically a dietary-based cancer treatment. She also advocated for anti-vaccination and consumption of unpasteurized raw milk. In Australia, the sale of raw milk is illegal in all territories showing that Gibson was blatantly ignoring her government's directive by preaching the gospel of raw milk consumption. In 2015, a four-year-old kid identified as Apu Kangura died of hemolytic uranemic syndrome. Seven others became seriously ill due to raw milk consumption, prompting the Australian government to put tougher regulations. Gibson's public display of a depleted, sickly, and soon-dying person came with some goodies. Amazingly, nobody questioned her good looks, especially for someone dying from six different cancers. Avocado is good for you, but it's not that 
good for you. The deals with the world-recognized brands like Apple and Penguin left more questions than answers. Gibson made millions, flew first class, and attended international conventions, but what does that say about the due diligence on the side of her sponsors? Apple helped take Gibson's public mockery and lie to international levels by gobbling up her lies without confirming them. Tech giant boosted Gibson's public profile readability by including the whole pantry app in their Apple Watch prototype. Penguin did the same thing by granting Gibson an international cookbook deal. Two companies, therefore, failed the public and should take part of the blame for the roles they played. Isn't it fair to say that Apple and Penguin failed to do due diligence, thereby unknowingly aiding and abetting the crimes and forgery conducted by Gibson? What's your take? Let us know in the comment section below. Gibson claimed that she had undergone heart surgery several times and even died momentarily on the operating table, a story that attracted honest tears from those who sympathized with her. Still, as it turns out, it was just more lies, nothing genuine. Gibson also revealed in her previous interviews that during such trying times, she suffered a stroke. However, the mother of one wasn't able to substantiate all of these medical claims or mention the names of the doctors who diagnosed and treated her. Moreover, Pretty Lady didn't bear a single mark of surgical scars from her several operations. The hope was beginning to crack. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and Gibson's story touched the hearts of people around the world that were battling cancer. They bought hope in the form of her app and cookbook, never thinking for a moment that Gibson be making it all up. Why would she? Why would someone lie about that? One such person is a girl named Maxine. When she was in high school, she was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Doctors put her on medication, which left her with the usual side effects. But when she saw Gibson's story, she felt relieved, thought to herself, why not? So Maxine abandoned medication and started following Gibson's tip. Dixie Turner is another victim who fell for Gibson's rhetoric. She tried medication, but later joined Gibson's online wellness community. Both Maxine and Pixie were among the first members of Gibson's wellness program. Soon, Richard Goulet, a journalist and researcher on cancer ailments and treatment, noticed something wasn't adding up with Gibson, her app, and the message she relayed to her fans. February 2015, Richard met Gibson in Melbourne while she was promoting her book. During their interview, Gibson found it hard to answer some of Richard's questions and instead diverted into some far-fetched explanation. When he asked about her most recent cancers, Belle took him on a roller coaster of an end. Ultimately, she said she was no longer seeing that doctor, was unsure whether or not she had these cancers. While Richard wasn't able to prove she was lying beyond a shadow of a doubt, he could speculate. He writes about his interview with Belle, and it spreads wide and far across the internet like a virus, like cancer. Gibson's story attracted split opinion. New revelations and contradictory stories popping up with every single interview, thousands of her followers were hit by a cast of doubt, yet others still chose to believe her. The last nail on the coffin would be her failure to deliver the $300,000 donation she promised to give to charity. She also claimed that she gave away 25% of her company's profits, and in her book wrote that a large part of everything she earned was donated to charitable causes. In December 2013, Gibson held a fundraiser in Melbourne to raise money for three charities. One Girl, which runs education programs in Sierra Leone, was listed by Gibson as one of the beneficiary charities, but the organization didn't receive a dime after the fundraiser, and she only donated $1,000 after media inquiries following a 15-month wait. Another Asian-based foundation also said they never received a penny from Gibson after she told the media she'd given them $2,800. Gibson's boat was sinking. It was time to go down with the ship, or come clean about her lifelong fraud. In 2016, Gibson revealed that none of her cancers were true. She told Australian Women's, a weekly magazine, that she didn't want forgiveness. She believed people would hear her revelation and think, it's okay, she's only human. Her admission, as expected, attracted unwavering backlash from her followers. They felt betrayed and had every right to. Gibson had touted unbacked claims that holistic medicine had kept her cancer at bay. In reality, there was never any cancer to begin with. For those who were really suffering, the damage had already been done. There's no telling how many of their cancers had worsened since abandoning their doctors, putting their faith in Bell. Millions of people faulted her for putting the lives of cancer patients in danger by suggesting dietary approaches and telling them to abandon scientific methods. In September 2017, Gibson was fined $410,000 for making false claims about her donations to charity. As recently as April 2019, she had not settled the fine, and authorities have been hot on her trail, hoping to charge her with contempt of court. Later in 2019, Gibson claimed to be $170,000 in debt and only had $5,000 to her name. In January 2020, Gibson's home was raided, and the authorities seized some of her items in an attempt to recoup the unpaid fines, which by then, due to interest and costs, had exceeded half a million 
million. Her home was raided again in May 2021 with the same intention. A day after the first raid on her home, Gibson appeared on a video claiming to have been adopted by the Ethiopian community in Melbourne and even partly introduced herself in the indigenous Oromo dialect. She referred to the adoption as a gift from Allah, but in a quick retort, the president of the Australian Oromo community said that Gibson was not a registered member nor a volunteer. He was well aware of Bell's past and didn't want anything to do with it. Do you think Gibson's next venture is to defraud the Ethiopian community in Melbourne? Or she genuinely transformed? But the thought that we can't shake is how a company like Apple could have been so easily duped. Did they bite down on Gibson's story with nothing but dollar signs in their eyes? Is Gibson's story more than anything a comment on corporate greed? As if she's reciting incantations from a Harry Potter novel, Don Bennett casts a spell over SEC investigators trying to topple her $20 million Ponzi scheme. Yes, this was a lady who had mason jars full of cow tongues performing some sort of black magic in an effort to keep SEC investigators quiet. Somehow, this was the same woman who was able to get over $400 million from investors to manage for them. Don Bennett had been in the financial business long before becoming an infamous scammer. She began as a broker in 1987 at Wheat First Securities, a brokerage and institutional capital firm. Later, she registered with Leg Mason Wood Walker, a firm in which she was able to secure some of her most loyal clients. By 2006, she had started her own investment firm, Bennett Group Financial Services. By all accounts, her company ran a legitimate operation for years. Authorities claim that while it didn't operate illegally, it provided Bennett with a database of possible victims. Bennett established herself as a respected figure in the world of finance and achieved the ranking of fifth best woman to invest with in 2009, according to Barron's Magazine. Barron's is a financial magazine run by Dow Jones and Company and considered the leading opinion on savvy investors in finance. Bennett was listed in the top five alongside women like Sally Glassman of Merrill Lynch, one of the biggest investment firms in the U.S., among others. To solidify her presence, Bennett created Financial Myth Busting with Don Bennett, a radio show that began airing on AM radio in Washington, D.C. and Maryland. Her radio show helped her reach an untapped market she soon realized would be a gateway for her business ideas. She would cover a wide variety of topics centering around the economy, politics, and personal finances. She featured interviews with popular writers and opinion makers on her show, interviews with experts from MSNBC, the Coolidge Foundation, and notorious investment firms across the nation made it a space where ordinary people could understand finance, social issues, and politics. While her show had a limited broadcast range, it was a popular channel in the DC, Maryland AM radio area. She had a mixed bag of guests, ranging from authors to financial analysts. Her topics were quite interesting, which is how she developed a loyal following. Since most of her topics were directed towards people with stable income or hefty savings accounts, it came as no surprise that the majority of her audience were elderly or retired Americans. Some victims referred to Bennett as a close friend because they would listen to her constantly. She was a friendly voice in their ears. With the reputation of a respected financial expert and plenty of needed exposure, Bennett started her quest towards creating her newest online venture, DJBennett.com. She used her radio personality and privilege to ask her friends and listeners for money to invest in her company. DJBennett.com aimed to become a leading online store for luxury items like designer clothes and accessories from brands like Barber and Porsche. Bennett success successfully netted 46 different investors, mostly older folks, for her company. But how exactly was she able to score so big? Bennett asked for her clients' investments and in return, granted them promissory notes offering a 15% return on their investment. She promised to spend the money on backing the store's operations, expenses, and all costs involved. This, of course, was not true. For several years, Bennett secured single investments between $750,000 and $3 million, reaching a total of $20 million. Some of these investments came from her clients' retirement funds. As she had access to many of her wealthy clients' retirement savings, she advised them to invest in her company to guarantee their safety, telling them that the current stock market was too dangerous. To certify that her operation was legitimate, she provided them with fake financial statements that made her company look more profitable than it was. She assured investors their money was safe in DJB Holdings, her parent company, and all of its assets. DJB is the same company she used to get a $700 $50,000 line of credit from a bank falsely stating she had a brokerage account valued at over $4 million. It turns out the actual value of the portfolio was only $35.24 to be exact. A sole individual 
rarely operates a scam of this size on their own, and Bennett's case is no exception. Court reports found that much of Bennett's financial frauds were performed by her CFO, Bradley Masho. Masho had been accused of making false statements and inflating the company's profile to attract more business. According to authorities, Masho operated with Bennett's knowledge since no documents served as evidence that both of them had worked together in this part of the scheme. So while legally they could not prove they were in cahoots, where there's smoke, there's fire. She promised her investors she'd use the money to fund her operations. Instead, Bennett used it to fund her lavish lifestyle. As a fan of luxury brands, it's not surprising Bennett spent her investors' money on herself. Court documents show she spent thousands upon thousands at Saks Fifth Avenue. Bennett also spent over $140,000 on astrological gems, including a single gem that went for almost $30,000. Luxurious vacations at the Ritz-Carlton and South Beach were also among her favorites. She paid $500,000 a year for a VIP box at the AT&T Stadium in Dallas, Texas to watch the Dallas Cowboys. Then it was unconventional, so her random $100,000 budget on cosmetic surgery made sense. But what surprised investigators the most was the $800,000 spent on religious rituals, where she arranged sessions with priests to protect her from authorities. At first, the spending wasn't a problem, as she was receiving single investments of $850,000 and more on a constant basis. But as time went by and her spending sprees kept increasing, she found herself paying off old investors with cash from new investors. She was running a bona fide Ponzi scheme. Her image cracked in 2005 when the SEC charged her company with fraudulently inflating her company's profile in an attempt to lure investors. Authorities became aware of how Bennett would speak to her customers about how investing in DJBennett.com was a profitable opportunity. She claimed her company was among the top 1% of firms in the world. A flat-out lie. Bennett used her radio show to make wild claims about her company's assets. She told listeners she was managing $2 billion when official documents show that it was around $400 million. Why would she need to inflate the number of $400 million, which was already impressive enough? She lied just to lie. According to the SEC, Bennett's company made several false claims about their profile between 2009 and 2011 at the height of their financial investment advisory. Bennett was ranked among the top women to invest with by Barron's. The SEC found that Bennett used her radio show on at least 18 occasions to speak about the fake assets the company was managing while simultaneously posting about it on their Facebook page. As if that wasn't enough, Bennett continued to misrepresent her company, claiming she had as high as $1.8 billion in assets under her belt. Her lies earned her the number two spot in Barron's top 100 women to invest with in Washington, D.C., 2011. The SEC was tipped off again when a bank representative from Old Line Bank, Maryland, found some suspicious activity in one of her client's accounts. An older woman wanted to transfer around $32,000 to Bennett's company as part of an investment in DJBennett.com. The bank rep read the investment and felt it was too risky for a woman at that age. The bank did a background check on Bennett and discovered her prior investigation regarding her fake company role. A further investigation also found that she had misrepresented her company to Barron's. It wasn't long before her investors were looking for those 15% returns Bennett promised them. They started asking for full refunds, some breaking all communication with the company, only wanting to be notified when Bennett transferred their money. A wise woman herself, Bennett had written a literal excuse list she used to calm angry investors. Her favorite excuse was out on business travel. According to the FBI, Bennett stated she had traveled to China to avoid angry client calls, but there are no records of Bennett leaving the U.S. during that time. It didn't take long for investigators to realize that they had been scammed. Those promissory notes were worth less than a jar of dirt. Bennett was known for twisting information to convince her clients. In the case of John Dalmas, a 60-year-old woman from Maryland, Bennett told her and her husband that investing in her company was safer than investing in the stock market. The couple handed over $150,000 from their retirement accounts. Dalmas stated Bennett confirmed the millions of dollars she had in assets and how she was personally responsible for the promissory notes she had handed out. Now, Dalmas and her husband may never be able to retire. Another man in his 60s who invested in her company, Mark Hale, said he felt betrayed by Don. 
Hale had invested upwards of $200,000 in Bennett's company and now faces the possibility of not retiring. Overall, Bennett scammed 46 clients out of their money, raking in $20 million, almost $434,000 per victim. Bennett's case gets even weirder when the FBI raids her home. Inside, they found two freezers filled to the brim with frozen mason jars. In the mason jars, they found severed cow tongues. It was part of a ritual aimed at stopping the SEC from investigating her. Bennett split the tongues and recited an incantation to perform the spell, commanding the target to hold their tongue. Mason jars were inscribed with a person's initials, initials that belonged to SEC agents. Bennett sought all the magical help she could get. She spent over $800,000 on religious ceremonies and rituals to throw investigators off her trail. Investigators found an excerpt of a letter she'd written these priests that described how she was in a very tough fight against her enemies and needed all the help she could get, black magic and all. When she was finally caught in 2019, Bennett received 20 years in prison. She was found guilty in 17 charges that ranged between securities, bank, and wire fraud. She also faced federal charges for conspiracy and making false statements for a loan application. She was held responsible for running the operations of a fraudulent Ponzi scheme in which she hurt 46 investors and stole $20 million from their savings and retirement accounts. She'll have to comply with an added five-year period of supervised release when she has done time in prison. As for her accomplice, Brad Masho, he was sentenced to 30 months in prison for charges related to scam. He admitted to lying under oath when questioned about SEC claiming Bennett made to it. At her trial, Bennett claimed to be profoundly humiliated, but what for? Is she humiliated that she stole $20 million from unsuspecting people on the verge of their golden years? Or that she'd been dubbed the voodoo queen of Ponzi schemes? The female Bernie Madoff. Gina Champion Kane was a charismatic, well-respected business leader in the San Diego community. Award-winning and recognized, she founded the Patio Group, which was a business that operated multiple restaurants across the city of San Diego. On the outside, she appeared to be an honest and hard-working businesswoman. But in June 2020, the San Diego business community was in for a big shock. People discovered that Gina had orchestrated a huge Ponzi scheme for many years. It was a scheme that successfully scammed investors out at the very least $372 million. How exactly did Gina go from being admired to disgraced and hated in the San Diego community? This story of deception and greed starts in 2012. For some reason, that was the time for Gina to start her life of crime. She started approaching investors with a pitch. Her business was supposed to help restaurant owners in the area with high interest loans so they could get liquor licenses in California. At the time, Gina ran a successful firm called American National Investments, or ANI. She was able to lure investors with the reputation of her firm. She framed the process of getting liquor licenses as difficult, lengthy, and costly for business owners. She positioned ANI as the best solution for business owners who were looking to get a liquor license in order to attract even more customers. The businesses were pitched as seasoned businesses with established cash flows that could easily pay the high interest from the loans. It was practically a guaranteed return. Gina just didn't have enough money to loan out. The promise of big returns attracted the attention of investors, of course. Course. For the prospectus she gave out, Gina prepared a list of businesses looking to acquire the licenses. The list of businesses, however, was simply completely made up. Gina had found businesses that previously had held valid liquor licenses. So the list comprised of valid businesses that had licenses that were canceled or expired through the alcoholic beverage control website. But none of them needed her help for renewing their liquor license. With her outstanding local reputation and her being the face of many recognized restaurants in the area, she didn't have to overcome many barriers to secure trust from anyone that was looking to grow their money. Her first investor reportedly invested tens of millions of dollars into her program. As she recognized the potential of her scam, she recruited employees from her firm to scale up her operations and further convince more investors of the validity of her program. A Ponzi scheme only works when investors have trust that they would get returns on their investment. Of course, 
Gina gave the promise of a return on their investment in order to lure more and more potential investors. In some cases, she promised investors returns of 15 to 25% per year. As Gina raised more from investors, she began paying out profits to her early investors. These profits, however, weren't what they seemed. Of course, the returns were just paid out with new investors' money. To keep the scheme's momentum, Gina paid out around $200 million to early investors, securing their trust and building word of mouth in the business community. She continued to pay out to investors throughout the scheme. During this time, Gina also began using the money for her own use. She funneled a proportion of the funds into the patio group. Many of her businesses within the group were simply failing or had negative cash flows. She used investor money in an attempt to prop up her less successful restaurants and prevent them from going out of business. Millions of dollars of investors' money also just went directly into Gina's pocket. Gina began to live a life of luxury. She bought cars, jewelry, and luxury homes. She began sitting in the best seats at the Padres and Chargers games in San Diego. She was living the high life. All the while, her investors were in the dark, believing that their money was growing. As her Ponzi scheme kept growing, Gina knew she had to meticulously cover her tracks. She began getting more and more questions from her investors. Documents were fabricated and signatures were forged to show how successful her scheme was. Investors that called about their funds were redirected to a third party that claimed to be monitoring Gina's Ponzi scheme. These accounts were instead secretly managed by her ANI employees who were part of the scam and sometimes Gina herself would run the accounts. As Gina's scheme continued to grow larger and larger over the years, one investor grew especially suspicious and took action. This investor contacted the Securities and Exchange Commission, better known as the SEC. This is the government agency responsible for protecting investors and enforcing laws that prevent market manipulation. They began a probe into Gina's activities along with the FBI. Knowing that they were in trouble, Gina and her co-conspirators began a frenzied effort to obstruct the course of justice and hide their illegal operation. So what did Gina do when the SEC asked for documents? She simply just got rid of it. Gina immediately changed the email retention policy of American National Investments. This way, the communications between her and her co-conspirators were destroyed within 24 hours and didn't leave any trails. With investigators rapidly closing in, she also began physically destroying evidence related to the scheme. She gave out instructions telling her employees that were in on it to shred any incriminating documents. Records of her personal transactions were also modified in an attempt to hide her spending activities. However, the Ponzi scheme was just too much to cover up. It was impossible for Gina to make all of her illegal activities disappear into thin air. Over the seven years the scam was running, nearly 500 investors were duped. Almost $400 million was stolen from them. Incredibly, in the final weeks of the scheme, Gina attempted to swindle investors out of even more money somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 million. In the end, the restaurants previously operated by Gina were taken over by another large restaurant group. On July 22nd, 2020, Gina Champion Kane pleaded guilty for her role in the massive Ponzi scheme. She received three consecutive five-year sentences for securities fraud, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy. For creating a giant Ponzi scheme that reached over $400 million, she got a total of 15 years in prison. One of Gina's co-conspirators, Crispin Torres, chief financial officer at ANI, was also sentenced to four years in prison for his role. Torres was responsible largely for identifying Gina's businesses that required a cash boost and then funneling investor capital into them. Supposedly, Gina wanted to write a personal letter to each and every investor to show how sorry she was. Her lawyer advised her to not do it. Here's what's next. 